episode two of Dielectric Videos. Now you've probably heard me talk quite a bit about my isolation transformer, and you've probably heard me talk about why it's such a useful tool to have within your uh, repertoire of supplies for your hobbyist or for your laboratory setup. Now, this is my homemade isolation transformer. I built this one from an old scrap transformer that I bought for just next to nothing, relatively speaking, at a surplus store. I mean, basically, it's it's got its fair share of issues. It's probably vintage mid-1950s. There was no real timestamp or serial number built into it, but it's based, based on the style of transformer, I could estimate that it was probably mid-1950s. It's a relatively old one. It's got the cloth wire in the back of it, uh, but it did work, and that's why I bought it. You can also see one of the problems on the front it looks like it's been plasma cut away from whatever it was originally mounted to. Now disregard these brackets because I added these, but there's this huge dent on the front. And it looks like at some point somebody dropped it and whacked the front of it pretty hard. Now I was a little concerned that this would adversely affect its operational, operational status or even its ability to isolate if the primary and secondary coils had shorted together. However, after doing extensive testing, I've not found any reason to believe that that's the case, and as a result, I've been using this as my primary isolation transformer for pretty much all my mains voltage experiments. So what exactly does this do? Assuming you've already checked out episode one of the uh, dielectric videos series, you would know exactly what an isolation transformer does, and that is it keeps the mains voltage away from the ground potential, the potential of earth that you're usually standing on if you're in a lab or in a, if you're in your garage sitting on a piece of, on like a concrete surface, you're going to be to a certain extent biased to ground voltage. So what this does is it essentially turns the mains power, which I am sourcing right now from the electropup here, and converts it into magnetic field within the core of the transformer and then that magnetic field gets converted back into electricity on a secondary winding. Now what this does is it eliminates all connection, electronic connection rather, between the primary and secondary and thus between the ground biased mains power and the output power here. Now I'll show you that it is in fact generating the desired voltage here by this uh, light bulb here. And the light bulb lights up, so definitely we have power. I'll show you some of the more specific characteristics of this transformer as well, though. So I'll get my multimeter out, and here it is. Let's say I have it set to 120 volts output, and I measure across here. Well, if you can see my meter here, it's showing 121 volts output, which is about what you would expect. About 120 volts, which is the nominal voltage from the power company. In this configuration, it's a one-to-one -one transformer. 120 in, 120 out. Now, if I switch this over to 240, like so, you see the 240 light comes on, but there's nothing coming out of the 120 plugs now. But if I go over to the 240 and check it there, 243 volts, you're getting power. So if I leave it, uh, well, if I can get them in the holes, if I leave it there and switch it back to 120, you'll see also it's still not connect. It's still not showing 240 volts because this is now showing 120. Now, it, I I totally could have wired it so that it outputs both voltages at the same time. However, to do that would have required a center tap uh, connection for each 120 volt leg separately, and that would have meant I could only draw up to eight amps continuously for each leg. I'll get into why there's a limit on the power in a second, but basically. I wanted to have the two coils in parallel when I'm at 120 volts, so that's why I added the switch that distinguishes between the two. Now I also included an input switch, because this thing actually has uh, input taps on the primary that also allow you to select either 120 volts, two wires in parallel, or two coils in parallel, or 240 volts, two wires in series. So if I go to 240, you'll see that the neon bulb turned off. But that's only because it takes about 80 volts to make a neon bulb light up in the first place. If I wire this up here to my meter at 120, 
Surprise, surprise, 60 volts. It's still operating as a two to one because it's supposed to be getting 240 in and it's expecting 240. Now, can you predict what the voltage output would be if I select 240 now? Well, probably isn't too hard to guess that the output of the 240 volt plug will now be 120 because it's now operating once again as a one to one transformer. However, it's no longer operating as a one-to-one -one from 120 to 120. It's designed to operate from 240 to 240, but we're giving it 120 at the input, and because it's a transformer, it's gonna give 240 at the output. Now let's get into why this is such a useful apparatus for your laboratory or for your home DIY experimenting garage or whatever your setup is. Well, basically, besides giving you all these fancy voltages, depending on what you're asking it for, it also isolates, as I said, from ground. And in order to really be safe working with mains, you either want to have a GFCI, which is that thing on your bathroom wall with the light on it and the switch, which essentially turns the power off if it detects you getting shocked, if it sees the current flowing to earth instead of back to neutral. And that's great and all, but Sometimes you need to be able to have some leakage current go to ground depending on whether you're doing an experiment that has lives that eventually connect to ground or if you're just doing something where you really don't want it to turn off at random because GFCIs, it's rare, but they can nuisance trip occasionally. So this is essentially the solution to that. It makes it so that no matter what the condition, the power stays on and it is relatively safe because there's less of a chance of you accidentally touching two points that are biased 120 or 240 volts apart at the same time. You've taken ground out of the equation. Now let me just prove to you that that's actually the case. Right now I have this connected to the electropup, which is of course an ungrounded source. I'm going to disconnect it so you see the light went off and connect it to a known good ground. Well, if I can get the uh, ground lift off. Oh, there it goes. So I'm going to connect it to this three-prong heavy-duty extension cord instead. And you'll see it's basically going to behave the same way. The light turned on, and I'll set it to 120 for demonstration purposes. Now this part of the transformer, as you can see, is separate from this part of the transformer. These are the control switches and the outlets, and they have this piece of wood between them and the transformer. Well, that's because on account of the big dent in the front of the transformer, I decided that it would probably be best to always earth it. That way there'd be no chance that the primary winding would accidentally touch the inside of the case and cause the case to become live. If that occurs because of this earth wire here, it will short circuit and blow its fuse. So that's just a safety precaution. But if you're using an isolation transformer, you don't always want your ground pin to be earthed. If your ground pin is earthed and say you're using a multimeter or like a benchtop multimeter, that, not like this kind of multimeter, but a big multimeter, it may have its, its negative terminal for its test lead, which would be essentially this, connected to its chassis ground, which would then be connected to this. And if that's connected to earth, and then it's also connected to this, well then this has 120 volt potential against the power supply. You don't want that because if you have 120 volts of the power supply and you test the power supply, pretend that this was a dead short, uh, then you're going to get, if I can demonstrate between, I'm not sure if that's hot or neutral, but if you connect this to this, uh, or maybe this to this, you're going to get 120 volts. And if I can move my hand, you'll see 120 on that meter. That's not a good thing if your multimeter has your negative terminal connected to your ground and your ground is connected to what you're measuring via the power company's transformer. It'll burn out your big multimeter assuming it's chassis grounded to earth. So you might want to float your ground. Well, Once you float your ground, now I'll do that same pin and connect it to here. You look on the meter, no voltage whatsoever. But wait, there's more to it than that. If you're just floating your ground, then why even have the ground pin? Well, there are certain circumstances where you still want the ground pin connected. And that would be, an example of that would be if you have a surge protector for your fancy computer, and you're trying to plug it into, say, an old house with 
two-prong outlets like the Electropub has. Well, if you do that, then you're putting your computer at risk because the big power strips with the surge protectors in them usually use the ground as the shunt for where they send their surge current. So if lightning were to strike the pole outside your house and say the 120 volts across here goes up to say 300 volts for a little bit, well the transformer is going to be happy, it is going to happily deliver 300 volts to your output. But your surge protector is not going to be able to shunt that out if your ground is floating. So that's why I included the transformer neutral. Now, if I get a little bit closer with my camera, you'll probably be able to see, if it zooms in properly, that I have labeled these as such. I have my, well, ah, there we go. So I have earth, output ground, and transformer, or earth float for output ground and transformer neutral. So if I set it to transformer neutral, not a lot has changed on the surface, but if I take my multimeter and I probe between the hot and the case, I'm going to get 120 volts. Now I have this hot biased to this case and the case is connected to the transformers neutral. So if I connect this across, you get 120. And if I connect this to the, to the case, there's also 120. So as you can infer, this might make it seemingly less safe. But keep in mind, it is still isolated from earth ground. So if I switch this back to earth, of course, this is now going to be connected to earth ground, but this won't be. And if I plug one into the hot, as we just saw, it was making 120, and the other to earth, now you see zero volts. Now I'm going to prove to you that that's the case, because keep in mind, you really want to be able to rely on this to isolate your systems. You can damage equipment and you can be shocked if it's not working properly. So I've already verified that there's no voltage between here and here. Now, just to prove to you that that is earthed, I am going to go and switch this over to ohms, and I'm going to test. I'll see if I can put this in view of the camera. Let me pop the little stand out for you. And I'm going to test the continuity between the grounded connector of the, uh, of the receptacle plug and the chassis. And as you can see, it has a very low impedance path across there, less than a third of an ohm. So that's right connected. And this is connected to the earth ground. I can prove that to you by probing the mains here and probing here. And if we can jiggle it enough and hopefully kind of demonstrate that. Uh, All right, I figured out what the problem was. Uh, I had my multimeter set back to DC volts after I had finished testing between the ohm setting. So let me just verify, now that I've confirmed that the multimeter is working, I'm gonna just verify again that there's uh, no potential between this hot and this earth here. And as you can see, well, as you can see now, there's not. And what I'm gonna prove to you now is that this, is, this chassis is in fact earth grounded. So I'm going to connect one pin to the chassis here, and you can still see the multimeter. And I'm going to connect the other to the electropup, which is mains. And you can see 120 volts between there. So yeah, this thing's grounded all right. And if I connect it over here, you'll see zero volts because that's the neutral. So how is this making it safer? Well, the point, of course, is that the outputs here are not in any way connected to this. And I'll demonstrate this in the following way. I have a screwdriver and I'm just mucking around with the controls, for example, and oops, it's in the hole. And we can actually test that it has that potential by putting one probe on the neutral like this and the other probe on the screwdriver. See the 122? Whoa, dangerous stuff. But I'm going to have my hand touching this uh, earth connected box, which sounds like a really bad idea. and. Nothing. I can hold on to that all day. I can put my hand all the way across it. No trouble. This is the essence of an isolation transformer. No potential between the hot side or the ground. In fact, just to show you, no potential between the neutral and the ground either. It's isolated. Now, if I had this set to transformer neutral, I'd be in for a horrible, nasty shock off of that. But when it's set to earth, 
And this is totally earth. It's the same earth at your house, same earth at my house. Nothing, which is a good thing. So now you've seen the purpose of the isolation transformer. Now, granted, the one I've built is a little bit kind of cheapy. The transformer is not in great condition. So if you're going to really rely on this like all the time, I would go with an actual professionally built isolation transformer because the windings will actually be physically separated by big separators. Some of them even have them on different spindles within the core. This is just a cheap two to one transformer. It's never really designed to be an isolation transformer. Now, because as you saw, I was only putting the current, uh, putting the p possible potential across one hand because I'm not fully confident in this transformer because it's such an old, low, lower, potentially lower quality one. That being said, it's pretty darn reliable. It's certainly better than just working on the mains with no connection to, uh, with no isolation. If you have a connection to ground and you touch something in there, you're going to have a bad day. So the isolation transformer is still obviously a good choice to have for your lab. Whether you build it yourself or buy one professionally built, it's up to you. But I wanted to show you mine to give you some ideas about it. Now before I leave, I'm sure all of you are probably interested in how it actually is wired. If you're bored by wiring diagrams, feel free to stop the video now. I'm just going to do another few minutes to check on or to show you guys how the wiring diagram is for this one and how I built it. So I'll show you that in just a second. So here is my original wiring diagram that I actually drew up on the back of some random piece of paper before I even started building this transformer. So basically, here is the gist of it. I'll use that same screwdriver that I was messing around with earlier to show you. So here's the input uh, going to the two coils on the primary side of the transformer, denoted by H1, H2, and H3, and, and of course H4. Now, this is where I select whether I want 240 or 120 coming in. You see there's an input select switch, which you saw on the top of my transformer already, and it basically decides whether these should be connected in series, which would be for a 240 input, or in parallel, which would be a 120 input. Now, per the design specifications of this transformer, it wants only 120 across each coil. If you give it 240 across the coil, the core will saturate. And what that means is so much magnetic flux will build up in the core that it won't be able to oppose the flow of current through the coils. And as a result, the transformer will be extremely inefficient and generate inordinate amounts of heat. You don't want that. So you have to decide if you want 120 in, you have to go parallel to get the optimum effect of the transformer. But if you have 240 going in, you have to go in series to keep from overheating and burning out the transformer. Now on the other side of the core, we have our two bars of isol isolation, and then we have X1, X2, X3, and X4. In power transformers, the H generally refers to the primary, and the X generally refers to the secondary. This is where things got a bit more complicated because I wanted to be able to choose between 120 volts out and 240 volts out, but I also wanted them to be mutually exclusive. I wanted to make sure you couldn't have both at the same time, or I wanted to make sure you couldn't accidentally have 120 coming out of the 240 plug. So what I did was I used a three-pole uh, three two-way switch uh, with, as you can see, the three poles. And what I did was I used the first two to just do the normal switch between 120 and 240. So what essentially happens is the same thing on the input select happens on the secondary of the transformer. And essentially you're deciding whether you want these in series to give 240 or in parallel to give 120. The problem, however, is if you have them connected in parallel for 120, uh, the two center taps are now at 120 volts apart. And that means that the outermost parts, which are wired to the 240 volt out, are also at that potential. So it's really not ideal to have 120 coming out of your 240 volt and your 120 at the same time. You want it to be decisive. You want it to only put out 240 on the output and only put out 120 on the input. So I added, uh, I used a three pole switch with three different uh, throws. Actually, this technically is a triple throw switch and connected the last one between the, as you can see, between the transformers X4 and the 240 out. What this does is it interrupts the transformer 
when it is operating at 120 and it interrupts the 240 volt out when it's operating at 120. That way the 240 doesn't stay on, albeit at a lower voltage. Then when you throw it to the other side to give it, 100, or give it 240, of course the 120 is shorted across as these are connected in parallel, guaranteeing that it won't have any potential. And the 240 is now get, uh, open, or rather is now closed when this switch is closed, and it's receiving power from X1 to X4. So that's the gist of how the transformer actually operates and how it's switched. The last thing I'll talk about is the grounding method here. And the grounding select is just a single, uh, single throw switch with two outputs, and the earth ground input is connected, of course, to the transformer chassis, but it has this choice where, depending on which way the switch is thrown, it can either connect to the 120 uh, center tap, which is the transformer's neutral, or it can connect to the earth ground. And what you see is this is going to the receptacle grounds, which of course are also connected to that, uh, those two metal electrical boxes on the top. The middle position of the switch is the float position, and that means that the receptacle grounds are neither connected to the earth nor to the output or to the uh, uh, X3 center tap of the transformer. And that, of course, is your floating position. Now, as you can see, I designed this uh, 1 16 2016, so a couple of months ago. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit old, but uh, I mean, that's a, that's a good track record because it means it's been doing two months of service and hasn't had any problems. And down here, this is just me making note of the three cables going from the boxes down to the transformer and what each wire does. You can see I split it into three cables because finding a cable with nine conductors in it is really kind of hard to do, but at your regular hardware store, you can pick up a piece of 12-3 or 14-3 cable that has three conductors in each. So, as you can see, the three cables, that's just what I'm connecting it to in terms of the transformer's taps and in terms of the transformer's chassis ground. So hopefully that was informative. Hopefully I didn't make too many errors in that. Uh, I might have made a bit of an error talking about double throw and triple throw versus double pull and triple pull. That being said though, you get the idea. You have a transformer or you have a, a switch for the transformer with three possible selectors and two options for each selector. They're all connected together as denoted by the uh, dotted line, just like on this one and that's how you control your output voltage. So, thank you for watching Dielectric videos, and I hope you have a good one.